This was a, a lecture that I presented at the American Physical Therapy Conference, the combined sections meeting, as you can see this year, uh, back in February. It was the Ann Shumway. Uh, Laura, how can I help you? Can, no, can you hear me though? Ah. Sorry. Is your button on? No, I'm, I was just trying to talk without that thing. But I'll put it on if they want me to. All right, I'll start over. <laughs> <laughs> Laura had a question. It's over there. Okay, Laura, let's check it out for you. I, I appreciate that. I don't want you in the back to miss a word. It's for the um, recording. Okay, how's that? Testing five, six, seven. Okay, hang on. I gotta hide it. Okay. All right. So uh, this is a lecture that was provided at the combined sections meeting this past year in San Antonio, and it's the Ann Chumway Cook uh, lectureship. The title, which I hope will become more evident to you, is "You Can Let Go of Me Now: Harnessing Neuroplasticity for Good and the Road Not Taken." The talk was sponsored by the neurology section, now called the Academy of Neurologic Physical Therapy. And uh, for those of you that are physical therapists, there's all these specialty sections. Uh, Mary Schmidt and I uh, grew up in the neurology section years ago, and it's a, it's a wonderful section, or pediatrics, to be part of, and really to, to develop leadership skills on committees and things like that. So if you're not part of a section, I, I encourage you to um, volunteer, do something, and, and learn more about your um, profession that way. Again, I mentioned that this talk was in honor of Ann Shumway Cook. She's still alive and well. Uh, the, Ann is a physical therapist, but interestingly enough, she's also a scientist, and what she's always done is build a great bridge between science and practice, and that's uh, what the talk is about, is trying to keep that translation open and, and build those types of bridges. So um, I want to share a poem with you. I'm going to read it. Many of you are familiar with this poem. Um, and it's The Road Not Taken by uh, Robert Frost. And it says, two roads diverged in a yellow wood. And sorry, I could not travel both. And be one traveler, long I stood, and looked down one as far as I could, to where it bent in the undergrowth. Then took the other as just as fair, and having perhaps the better claim, because it was grassy and wanted wear, Though as for that, the passing there had warned them really about the same. And both that morning equally lay, and Lee's no step had trodden black. Oh, I kept the first for another day, yet knowing how, e how way leads on to way, I doubted if I should ever come back. I shall be telling this with a sigh, somewhere ages and ages hence. Two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. Well, this poem, again, probably is very familiar on posters here and there. And most people think about the last two lines. And I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. But I think the poem is really about these two lines here, where it says, yet knowing how way leads on to way, I doubted if I should ever come back. And I hope you'll see, um, as I continue to tell this tale a bit, um, about, about why that means something to me. Now, uh, my father passed away this past year, and one of the things he left to our family was a biography of our family. None of us knew that he had been writing this for years. And so, um, my brother and I opened this, and we started to read this, and what was amazing was all the decisions he had made in his life, and all the roads he had come to, and all the forks in the road, and why he had gone one way or the other. And as his adult child, I started to learn some more about his decision making and why he did certain things that he thought was good, good for his family, good for his career or otherwise. And um, it was incredibly enlightening and really a, a cherished thing to have to look back. So what I want to do is share with you um, those kind of forks in the road in my life. This is not the path, it's one of many paths, but it's basically to say there, there will be forks in your life. And some of them are serendipity. Um, you don't know why it happens, it just did. And some of them you make a very conscious decision to go one road or another. But they tend to lead you down a path and maybe, maybe you're not coming back to this other one because of those, those decisions that you've made um, along that way. So we start on a, on a journey here. And I was a French major in college. 
but not for long because I became a biology major <laughs> soon after that. And I decided I would become a wildlife biologist. I did an internship in the Smoky Mountains in uh, January and February of 1976. We trapped wild boar. Yes, we trapped wild boar. <laughs> um, so after those two months in the very frigid, cold, smoky mountains, I decided not to be a wildlife biologist. <laughs> and way leads on to way. And so, um, and so from there, in college, I volunteered at a developmental center. Um, it had a lot of children with cerebral palsy, a lot of other um, developmental disabilities. And um, uh, one of the things I was exposed to there was a physical therapist. This was how she looked back in about 1974, 75. All right, probably had a nice patch on her shoulder. And what happened is we'd be in this uh, kind of like a nursery room. She'd come in and pick up a child, take them away, go next door, do something, then she'd bring them back and drop them in there again and she'd pick up another one. And that was my introduction to physical therapy. Something went on behind the curtain over there. Um, but I was curious about these, um, these children and the pr developmental problems that they had. Um, and then this happened to me. So what happened to me? Can anybody guess? Why am I wearing this item? This is 1976 to tell you. So, oh, that's pretty good. <laughs> All right, so I did. I did have some sort of knee surgery. Now, I had medial collateral ligament repair. I don't know, who's the person who's finished PT school most, re okay, they're already laughing over here. <laughs> All right, so if you had a medial collateral ligament repair today, I'm not sure this is this what you would receive. <laughs> okay? Now, okay, look at them. So things change, right? So I had to wear this for nine weeks, non-weight bearing, <laughs> non-weight bearing with crutches in the mountains in North Carolina. And I was a camp counselor teaching horseback riding. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so. <coughs> All right, so that was good. Um, what did I learn on this particular journey? Well, um, I, came out of that cast, and what did my leg look like? Just like, it looks like? Just like it looks right now, that's right. It was stuck, it was shriveled up, and it was hairy. <laughs> and um, so my mother and I are in Greenville, South Carolina, and our home is in North Carolina, and um, they, they, I still have my crutches, and they say, well, onward, take care, goodbye. And I was like, did you look? Did you see? And um, so the orthopedist says, well, I guess you could have some physical therapy. I was like, I don't even know what it is, but it sounds helpful, you know? So, um, so I went and it was very, I would, you know, they did all the stretching and strengthening and everything else. But what was interesting to me is I had an orthopedic problem, but I didn't have great coordination with my walking afterwards. And I couldn't, I was like, well, this is bizarre. I know how to walk. My left side knows how to walk. My right side's not so good. And so I was perplexed by that. And so uh, being a biology major now, I was, or having graduated, I was like, well, this is interesting. This is an interesting problem. And I'm intrigued by what you do to solve this problem. So that plus my background in this developmental center and uh, being a biology major, I started to explore the idea of becoming a physical therapist. But I thought for sure I was going to become a pediatric physical therapist. I was totally, totally interested in, in pediatrics, did an affiliation um, as, a, as a physical therapy student. Um, and I don't, for those of you who remember the Blue Max, it's an item where they checked you off for everything you were learning and you had to do it within five degrees or two degrees of what they said to move on. It was very procedural. And I kept saying to them, I said, listen, I don't think I'm learning how to think. Um, you just keep checking these things off. And I about failed that affiliation because I was so um, obstinate about, listen, I need to learn to think and not just have these things checked off. So that kind of ruined it for me in pediatrics. I was like, well, this isn't very good. Um, but I went on from there, had another incredible affiliation in the Blue Ridge Mountains of North Carolina um, at Woodrow Wilson Rehab, and I was like, ah, oh, found my thrill. These people love to think, um, work together, collaborate. I like this environment, and um, was sold on the idea of, of adult neuro rehab. Also was my first introduction um, to spinal cord injury. Off I became a clinician, um, yet knowing how way leads on to way, 
I doubted if I should ever come back to pediatrics. Uh, one of the things that has happened over time so is a lot of research has been done on situations like this, on non-weight bearing, on being casted or again having a spinal cord injury. And some of these individuals do research with models of spinal cord injury and animal models or they use what I'd say is the human condition. So they take someone who's had an ankle fracture and they say you're non-weight bearing for a period and then they look at the muscle and what's happened to it and then they look at muscle when you reload it. So we know a lot about this condition and being non-weight bearing and that's why our profession at some point in all its wisdom decided that casting someone non-weight bearing for nine weeks isn't such a good idea for an orthopedic problem. And so we did a flip-flop. We switched from Im immobilizing someone to mobilizing them early. And really you've seen that across our profession in many ways, even if pain management, any of these types of things. In, in our day, you go into, if you had back pain, you were in the hospital on your back for two weeks laying down doing nothing and then they'd start to move you. All right, very different. You can go into an ER now and start right away if you have back pain to get treatment by a physical therapist. So we've, we've flip-flop and understood kind of the, the woes of immobilization. All right, so, ah. Uh, I'm on my way, I'm a clinician, I'm trying to make my decision about where I should start my career and uh, I had been at this wonderful rehab center in Virginia, Do, went around um, through the southeast, look at a lot of different places. Now um, you all at Fraser and maybe at Children's and other facilities are going to understand this. Um, so the OTs wore red and the PTs wore blue and somebody else wore yellow and I didn't like that idea. And so. <laughs> Everywhere I went, I said, do you wear a uniform? And they'd say yes, and I'd say, well, I'm not going to interview there. And I'd, then I'd go to another place. <laughs> so this was my criteria for decision making at this point. <laughs> and I was looking for a place that was said no uniforms, um, which was the place I had interned at. And finally, they had an opening, and I went back there because I could dress um, typically. And listen, I, I, it wasn't just the preferences. Listen, I thought the people who were in rehab, um, uh, they'd had this uh, injury and they had an acute experience being a patient, but they weren't sick anymore. They had this traumatic event in their life, but now we were helping them to move on and move forward. And so I thought we should start treating them as individuals and human beings and recognize that. And so philosophically, it didn't register with me that I should have a uniform on um, and just a personal personal bias. So I ended up in uh, the beautiful Blue Ridge Mountains of, of Virginia and the Shenandoah Valley, a very progressive, dynamic community of, of young people. Every day I worked, I couldn't believe I, I got to work and I got to work with my friends and, and many of you have that esprit de corps um, where you live and work um, right now. This was what we call the golden era of rehabilitation. Why? Because people were in rehab for six, eight, nine months um, after a spinal cord injury. You can't believe that now, can you? I mean, this was inpatient, not outpatient rehab, and they were there for that length of time. Susan Harkeman would love it. <laughs> I mean, because you go, wow, I've got all that time to do all of this kind of care and treatment. I'd love to have it back. But well, then um, healthcare tried, started to change um, as it continues to do so now. Um, during that period, uh, a woman named Marilyn Hamilton uh, was hang gliding and she was 28 years of old. She was a um, um, high school teacher and uh, she crashed uh, her hang glider and suffered a spinal cord injury. Ended up in a wheelchair uh, much like this one. Um, it's an Everson Jennings, as she and I both call it a clunker. Um, and she got in that chair and she, she was like, I, I can't live in this chair. This just doesn't, like it doesn't fit, it doesn't work, it doesn't feel good. It didn't make sense to her. And so she got with her hang gliding friends and said, let's get together and figure out a better wheelchair. And so she took materials that you use for hang gliding. They're very uh, durable but lightweight. And this was the exact garage they worked in and they formed a new kind of chair, a modular or a rigid frame chair also. And, uh, and really made a chair that was custom to the individual and custom size. In our era there was 18 inch and 16 inch width and that's all you had. So everybody in this room would have those two sizes. If you wanted a custom, we're gonna have to wait about six months and then we might get it in. Uh, oh, you want uh, colored upholstery? Oh, that's custom. And it's gonna cost you more, et cetera, et cetera. 
This woman revolutionized the wheelchair industry for every person since. Um, she's still alive today. Uh, she's uh, been injured about 40 years now. Um, delightful, delightful individual. Um, she was uh, an incredible wheelchair athlete, played uh, tennis, won many trophies, but she also won many awards for her design work as far as um, the wheelchair industry. Every other wheelchair company started to copy her. You might know her as the person who um, created Quickie wheelchairs. And Sunrise Medical ultimately bought, that, bought them out and um, runs that company now. So Marilyn was at a, um, a conference held by the Christopher and Dana Reeve Foundation. It was a symposium in Phoenix. And at this particular symposium, they bring together people with spinal cord injury and scientists. Believe it or not, there are many scientists who've ne who do spinal cord injury research who've never met a person with a spinal cord injury. And so they would bring them together and have them face to face and have the people talk about what are their issues, what are their priorities. And so this day, she was talking and she said this, I never really understood why the therapist had me strengthening the parts of my body that worked and did not focus on the parts of my body that didn't work. It's an amazing statement. And back, way back, I could answer her in a certain way. Back in the 70s when she was injured, what was our understanding and knowledge about the nervous system? And so I would likely have said to Marilyn, um, and consistent with the textbooks by then, Marilyn, here's how the nervous system is controlled. You have a brain, cortex, brainstem, spinal cord, and really if you have an injury and separate those descending signals, you can't walk anymore. There's no communication between the brain and the spinal cord, and we're going to teach you alternative ways to move. We're going to strengthen everything above the lesion. We're also going to give you a wheelchair, and then we're going to show you really alternative ways to move that take advantage of, of uh, physics principles and leverages and momentum and things like that because you're weak. And then you're going to have virtually a new life as someone who's had a spinal cord injury. And so we're going to teach you alternative ways to move. And so if you want to get up in a wheelchair, you're not going to stand up and get there. You're going to do something we call the head hips. Your, heads are gonna, your head's going to go down. Your bottom's going to go up. You're going to get your bottom in the chair and up you're going. We taught compensatory strategies nonstop. We were very good at it. We can teach you how to use a wheelchair, how to do a wheelie, how to get around. And the same principles applied for children, except we put children in standing devices a lot more than we do adults, all right? Standers or pyripodiums, things like that. And so, Marilyn, that's why we don't pay attention to the limbs that don't work. There's no way for you to communicate with them from your brain to your spinal cord. So our inability to resolve paralysis has really been the mainstay and the focus and the foundation for rehabilitation for years. And we base our treatment plan on the integrity of these descending connections between the brain and the muscles below the level of the injury. And we test them by observing voluntary movements that a patient performs. All of you are familiar with the Asia exam. And so we do all kinds of things where we voluntarily ask you to lift your knee towards your chest as far as you can. We grade that activity and again, we look at other and other limbs and other joints and all those aspects. From that, a cascade of clinical decisions is made based on the degree of voluntary movement below the level of injury and the neurological level of injury. We predict the patient's degree of functional independence, the physical assistance required, mobility via the wheelchair or ambulation and the equipment needs. Now, if we look across the textbooks that have come out since the 1970s to now, it is pervasive that this is how decision making is made in every one of these textbooks. Again and again and again and again and again and again and again. This is how we, we think. So um, this is, I'm going to introduce you to two gentlemen that were my first two patients as a young therapist at, at Woodrow Wilson um, Rehab. Now, uh, the gentleman on the left was a high school student who was walking down the hall, um, felt a pain in his neck, uh, went to the kind of the nurse's office, uh, sat down, never stood up again. And so he had a, a blood vessel burst and he become, became, um, had a cervical injury. The other uh, this gentleman on your right was 14. He uh, dove into a, a rock quarry. He'll tell you as soon as he dove in there, he knew he was in trouble. And um, he broke his neck, uh, uh, floundered in the water a bit till his friends brought him out, um, sat him on the side, and, and he knew something was something was terribly, terribly wrong. So 
um, this was um, um, the 1980s, uh, a period that was uh, different in rehabilitation. I'll explain that in a minute. But the key thing to know is, um, for some reason, I liked uh, observing um, and learning at the same time. I started a, my own diary. I kept a list of every patient, not only that I saw, but that was in the gym. We shared, um, you had your caseload, but we also shared amongst us, so I knew everybody was in there, whether they had a stroke or a brain injury or spinal cord injury, and, and ready to learn from all of them at, at any moment in time. And I've done that through the years. I've continued to, and just like you have, you're learning from many of these patients. Uh, we teach these courses. We're always learning from people. These two and many others have, have continued to guide my thoughts for years because they behaved uh, very differently. Their presentation was um, very different. So what are some of the things I observed in the 1980s? Well, I saw people use their quadriceps or like a reflex where they would tap here or here to straighten their leg. And I was like, oh, well, that's interesting. They would functionally do that. They go, oh, that's good, my leg's straight. For whatever reason, whatever they needed, I was going, well, there's interesting. That's an interesting way to, to move, so to speak. Um, and then one day I had this uh, gentleman uh, standing in uh, long leg braces and some parallel bars, and I decided I needed to loosen the, the knee pads a little bit, all right? The knee pads help you stay in extension. Well, I loosened them a little too much, and whoop, down he went, he went down like a little too far. He was all right, but he went down a little too far. And, and I was like, oh, got to get you back up. And never had he done this before. We're weight bearing standing and he goes, mm, like this. And I was like, what'd you just do? <laughs> and um, I had done manual muscle tests on him, all these isolated movements. Never before had he pushed up like this. But we were weight bearing. And I was like, well, that's interesting. That's very confusing to me. <laughs> but if you get him out of that posture in any other place, his legs will kind of move all together, but there was no isolated movement, no um, voluntary knee extension. So this inability to perform isolated movements, um, well, that was, I was definitely aware of that. But I also saw some other types of movements. What I'd say are synergies. And synergies are when you have a movement that goes across joints. And so instead of just one movement, like extension here, you have extension everywhere, extension everywhere at your leg. And here, that was interesting because, listen, that's not in any book we have in spinal cord injury. And keep looking because it's still not in any book. And yet we have people that have patterns of movements after spinal cord injury instead of isolated movements. And it's actually a movement. And I think people thought, well, they're only spasms. So let me just give you an example. And so this gentleman here, I said, can you get back up in your chair? And he did. He's pushing and all of his legs his legs extend, but he's on his toes, he's way up in extension, turns around and sits down. Now, and again, I'm going, well, that's perplexing. So he had this extensor synergy that he kind of kicked off, and then he could use it to stand on and then sit back down. The same gentleman I could then put on a bicycle, and he could pedal the bike, but he couldn't walk um, over ground with that movement, or at least the way we were training him at that time. So. Uh, people again would say, oh, those are just spasms. Oh, just spasm. Don't worry about it, just a spasm. So I started to ask people if they were, if they had one of these happen or their legs suddenly took, took off. I'd say, well, can you slow it down? Can you stop it? Can you start it? Because what would that mean if they could do that? Well, they could have some sort of control over it. <coughs> There's some sort of descending signal in a relationship with that spasm, if you will, or that movement, or that synergy pattern. So I was like, well, that's curious. And lo and behold, over time, some people who paid attention to them could start to do that, could slow it down, reverse it um, with that pattern, or initiate it, right? Can you get it going? So here was this phenomenon of synergies that was new and this kind of idea of descending control. Another thing, and people would be in a C-shaped posture, um, kyphotic like this, and I'd say, can you sit up? they go, no, you know, I had a spinal cord injury. I can't sit up. I'd say, okay. So then I would take them and I'd say, well, let me just get you. I'm just going to hold you up here a minute. Can you hold that? Can you hold that? And lo and behold, they held it for a couple seconds. And they'd look at me and I'd look at them. I'd go, I don't know. But here's the thing. They kind of were sitting like this forever. 
and it turns out there was put some potential and they'd done it for so long they they hadn't really had the opportunity the experience to sit up not saying everybody did it but when I saw one person do it, I, it made me curious I'm wondering if another person could do that or why could they in this era in the 1970s the 1980s the percent of persons with incomplete spinal cord injury became greater than the percent of individuals with complete injuries anybody know why Fifty dollars a person. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> no betting. Um, so why? Mm. Say it again. Acute intervention. It's very close. What do you mean by that? What? Emergency medical. Yeah. So the emergency. That's exactly right. So what happened? It wasn't seat belts, but it was the emergency medical technicians on site. So many times, there were many stories in the 70s of you've had a car accident, we want to get you out, if someone or we're going to get you out of the car, they would get out of the car. In fact, the person would start walking, they'd turn their neck, fall down to the ground and never walk again. So there were, what they did was started the collars or the backboards. And so those two things changed this whole dynamic and it's changed it's remained ever since so we have more people now with incomplete injuries than complete and while you were in the clinic you kind of saw this this shift in the population from this complete to incomplete and what is incomplete well there's motor or sensory spearing below the level of lesion for one and so there was this this kind of opportunity if you will because you could see this voluntary motion going on all that was inconsistent with really the, the premier textbook back then, which was Ford and Duckworth uh, for spinal cord injury. Text did not focus on these individuals, and, the, and really all the others I showed you still, still don't really, if you read them, most of them are about people with complete injuries. It's really not something to, to point you what to do with people with incomplete. So I felt like there was this masked potential behind many of these folks, and I was trying to, how can we unmask this? Um, so I worked with two colleagues there, Woodrow Wilson. We tried to develop this clinical model for working with people with complete, incomplete injuries. M first presentation is 1987 at a combined sections meeting. Um, the three of us published a very clinical article. And really what we were trying to look at was some combination of, of if you don't have trunk control or if you have arm control and how much leg control and what kind of devices and um, uh, do you use, but how can you progress out of this? And so we had people kind of cycling back in if they improved in some way. Could you diminish the device, diminish the braces? But it was still very compensatory and built on um, having those devices um, available to you. All right, so one of the things that happened is in this period was I headed to the scientific literature. And so it had all these clinical observations. I'm going, well, somebody, somebody must know something more than I do. I'm, I'm a clinician right here. So I met, met through the literature uh, scientist Dmitry Hevick um, and uh, looked at some of his articles and he talked about motor control after spinal cord injury being on a continuum. And listen, I still have my original papers from the 1980s um, from these folks. They're in my office. They're just, they're brown and colored. I've scribbled on them since. I've scribbled on and against. And what was interesting is Dmitry Hevick Ha again had this continuum and he talked about all the way from no movement to a reflex all the way up to having balance responses and so he looked at motor control along here and he basically said you know you can look at someone with a spinal cord injury and talk about their motor control even at the level of a reflex and all the way up here but one of the new terms he had described in here was a term called discomplete never heard of that complete incomplete Discomplete. I was like, what's that? Well, he described it as an absence of voluntary motor activity does not preclude existence of a number of motor axons transversing the injury and influencing activities below the lesion. I was like, what? Influencing activities below the lesion? Okay, that sounds promising. That sounds like a good news story. And so how do, how do I know about those? How do, what does that look like? And so he continued to describe them and say there's this evidence of residual brain influence on activity below the lesion. Again, I'm going, how does that happen? He described patterns of lower extremity activity. 
where there'd be all flexion, so this kind of synergy again, all extension, or people had unilateral flexion or unilateral extension or flexion and extension. I'm going, hey, this is the first time I heard somebody talk about what I had seen. I'm going, all right, this is good. I'm connecting with this gentleman um, through the literature. And then he said spasticity was an expression of residual brain in, um, influence, brainstem influence on inner neurons. So I was like, spasticity. Oh, now influence. That sounds like something that we can change, we can direct. I'm going, well, this is interesting because everybody has talked about we need to get rid of spasticity, especially if you've worked in stroke. We got to get rid of spasticity. Spasticity is bad. As soon as we get rid of spasticity, all the good muscles, all the good strength can come and a person can move and there you go. We got to get rid of spasticity. But here he's talking about an expression of residual brainstem influence. I thought, well, that's kind of interesting. So again, I felt we had this um, untapped uh, potential. Well, I'd been in the um, uh, clinic for a good long time and become uh, an administrator in a facility. And if you've ever been a manager, there's one or two days where you, you absolutely hit your head on the wall and you go, I can't do this anymore. <laughs> so I had one of those uh, couple days change in management and um, they said I wasn't a team player, if you can believe that. And um, so I was like, well, I, I really can't function here anymore. I got to figure out a, a new path, a new journey. And um, so an, an opportunity became uh, available, which is another whole long story. Glad to tell somebody at some point if you're interested. But I had a colleague who is uh, Becky Craig. She's been the editor of the PT Journal and was a faculty member then at Beaver College. I was applying there. and. Um, I, they offered me the position. I kept weighing the pros and the cons and should I do this and not. And um, I turned down the position. I said, no, I, I just can't do it. And, and I, I was, I, it was too scary. <laughs> I didn't know, like, I never taught. I mean, I taught some clinical courses, but what do you mean being a faculty member? And um, she called me up and, and she goes, listen, why are you resisting the flow of circumstances? That's a comment my father would have said to me. So I said, Okay, I don't even know what that means, but I kind of get your flavor, and um, I'm going to do it. And um, I, I just kind of threw caution to the wind and said, really, I don't know what I'm getting myself into, but here I go. And so I um, started this position. Uh, my father couldn't believe uh, how uh, helpful people were. This is a small liberal arts college with an entry-level DPT, I mean, not master's program at that time. And... Um, how helpful everybody was. He was in academics and he said when he started, they nobody helped me, Andrea. He said, why, why are these people helping you? And I said, well, they're physical therapists. Um, so um, really it was an incredible experience that's now called um, Arcadia University. It's also in the period when motor learning came forward um, into our profession and it was introduced at the um, two-step, three-step, four-step, you may know of these conferences that really are there to dynamically change the profession with the greatest literature every um, 10 years or so. Um, so I ended up having more questions than answers. I had a lot of questions from my clinical viewpoint. And really, I, I kept asking, is recovery possible after spinal cord injury? And I felt like there might be, but how do we access or influence its potential via physical rehab? I mean, I couldn't quite understand it. It seems like there was a, a way into the nervous system, but I didn't know how. So I thought, well, I should go on. I was in academics. If I wanted to stay in it, I need to go on. So I looked at graduate school, ended up at the, at the University of Florida. I had two mentors there. My primary mentor was Dr. James Kura, um, who had a background in motor learning and control. And then I was a research assistant for a physiological psychologist, Philip Teitelbaum. Now, he looked at biological principles and how they supported behavior. And the difference was in motor learning and control, in that department, they treated the brain like a black box. And you could do these things, and then it would all be processed in the brain, and then you'd have an output. But you never knew what happened in here. And so everything was, again, how you set up the learning environment, et cetera, et cetera, to take advantage. You look at the output, but you never know why. So in my minor in physiological psychology, they looked at the brain and the spinal cord. And I was like, ah, all right, this is interesting. This must be where it is. So this really, this uh, research internship with him was an amazing period to try and um, introduce me to this idea that we could take advantage of biological principles, especially when there's an injury in one and there might be a redundant pathway, 
We might be able to take an, an advantage of another one and use that pathway to help someone. At the same time, I was about to finish my PhD, I had a little bit further to go. There are often um, talks or seminars on campus. I saw this one that was on recovery after spinal cord injury. Oh, I forgot to tell you. My PhD was in uh, an area in Parkinson's. So I couldn't find someone in spinal cord injury at that time. And I said, well, I'll just keep learning about rehab, about uh, working with people, and I'll understand something better, and I'll, I'll get to that later. So, because that's what I really wanted to do. Ended up, uh, go to this talk, and here's this science, uh, scientist. He's a basic scientist, renowned the worldwide for spinal cord injury from, um, again, from a basic science perspective and regeneration. He talks about recovery, and in the middle of his slides, he has this puzzle, and the key word in the middle is rehabilitation. And he has all these other words around him, like uh, stem cells and pharmacology, and he says, rehabilitation is the key to recovery after spinal cord injury. I'm like, oh my gosh, I found my thrill, you know? And I'm like, this is great, this is where I wanna be. And, and he says, rehab can be an agent for change. And I, I'd never thought of that. We always compensate. We help you, we adapt, but an agent for change in the nervous system. And so he talked about it that way. And then he said, what would you do differently knowing the choices that you and your patient make influence the magnitude and rate of recovery? And all of a sudden I was like, what do you mean I'm in charge or the patient is about choices we have for recovery? That doesn't make sense to me. I mean, that is amazing. Um, so Paul, Paul Ryer, um, you know, and I, I needed to finish and I had these um, blinders on because I'm trying to finish and you're supposed to be like this when you're finishing. But I heard this and I was like, oh my gosh, I can't listen to him, I can't listen to him. Um, so I finished and a job opening came uh, available uh, at the University of, of uh, Florida. And I was like, oh my gosh, what do I do? And it was in their physical therapy program. My PhD was up in exercise science. And um, this is not such a good program right now. Let me tell you, there's backstabbing faculty. It is a nasty group of people. Um, really, I was like, why go join them? Um, really, they had a bad reputation. Uh, so I was like, oh no. But I'd met this Paul Ryer. So I was like, well, can I figure out a way to work with him? So. I interview for the position and they say, is there anybody else you'd like to meet on campus while you're interviewing? And I said, oh yeah, Paul Ryer, Paul Ryer. So they get me an appointment, uh, I go up, I, I go into his office, and uh, Paul Ryer has an ego that would fill this room, okay? <laughs> so I'm like little, you know, new PhD, and uh, I go in, introduce myself, and he says, I don't know who you are, I don't know what you want, but you have 30 minutes to tell me. He pretty much says it like that. <laughs> okay, so I peed in my pants and then I, <laughs> yeah. so I'm shaking in my boots. I'm just like, okay, fine. So I, I start telling him, you know, my background as a clinician. I start describing these patients that were compensating a lot, but that I thought had potential, all these kinds of things. Lo and behold, he starts paying attention and we start having this dialogue. And we start going back and forth, and I tell you not, within that half hour, fireworks were going off in the room. <laughs> and, and I was like, oh my gosh, I can't believe this is happening. He goes, let me go get my colleague. And he brings in Doug Anderson, another basic scientist. And he comes in, he says, you've, you've got to meet Doug. I meet him, and he goes, let me bring in another colleague, Dina Howland. Dina Howland turned out to be an occupational therapist that I had worked with at Woodrow Wilson Rehab in the 1970s. She had left because she just got frustrated with compensation so much. She went back to school to get a PhD in neuroscience. And she had done all this animal model work and was a postdoc in his lab. I hadn't seen her in, I don't know, 20 some odd years. And in she walks and I'm like, you've been here? <laughs> so our paths crossed again. Um, and so I'm like, and he, and he says now, uh, who, who should I talk to in the PT department about you being here? So anyway, long story short, I ended up taking a faculty position there. No one in physical therapy in that era had ever crossed the street to talk to anybody in a neuroscience department. And that's pretty much how we had been as a profession for years. The clinicians lived in our little sphere, in our clinical conferences, and the basic scientists or the scientists were over here doing their thing. And we really weren't communicating. We weren't talking to each other. We weren't finding out about each other. So, um, I had this amazing opportunity to work with 
uh, four basic scientists, a physician across the top, Paul Weyer, Doug Anderson, Ed Worth, and Floyd Thompson. Mark Trimble, for, the, for those of you who knew Shelley Trimble, that was her husband. Um, so he was in the department also and started when I did. We did an amazing study on fetal neural tissue um, transplantation in patients with syringomyelia, myelia who had developed a secondary cyst after spinal cord injury. We're trying to see if we can develop, uh, change the development of that cyst as well as some of the secondary consequences of pain, sensation, loss of function um, afterwards. So there were several studies that were done. I'm the only person in the group um, who'd ever worked with humans with spinal cord injury. I was like, oh man. Um, they had animal models um, of cysts and all this work that had been done, incredible detailed work to be able to translate something they had done in an animal model to the human condition. What I really learned to respect was how they had done that and with what um, attention to detail that they did in order to move that to, um, to that um, uh, domain. Wonderful experience. Another gentleman, um, you all have probably read many of his papers or heard him in True Life, and that's Reggie Edgerton, uh, an ex uh, physiologist at UCLA, who's done much of the um, basic science work for, for many, many years. Reggie just asked a simple question, what does the spinal cord do in contributing to the control of locomotion? He used animal models here, a, a, a cat with a thoracic complete spinal cord injury, put them on treadmills, assisted them to step. Uh, he found out that it didn't, it, years and years of trying to get the cat to step. They did it first in kittens and it worked much better in kittens, but they went to the adults and they were trying to get them to be able to step. What they also found out was they, that the spinal cord was very smart and it would respond to sensory input. They could change the speed of the treadmill and the cat would change the speed even though he had no brainstem or um, uh, cortex influence. It was all the spinal cord that was interpreting that sensory information. That should be very apparent to you now because that's one of the, the principles that you use. Um, so here was Reggie and others talking about this neural control of, of walking. And again, you see this model, but now the spinal cord is, is not just a conduit for information, but the spinal cord itself becomes uh, intelligent in a way. And so that it has certain properties and that it can oscillate, turn on and off without uh, brain uh, descending influence. Flexors, or it's organized, the spinal cord is organized, so flexors talk to extensors, they can influence one another. There's left-right coordination at the level of the spinal cord. There's an interaction of inner neurons, so they respond to sensory cues, whether it's speed or load or things like that. And there's a motor output, can improve with practice. So I heard that and I was like, well this sounds, this sounds good. This sounds like something that, um, that I'm interested in. And I read all these animal um, articles, and then I had this gentleman come in one day, and I had not read any human literature yet. There was very little human literature then. So uh, being the scientist I was, I said, well, I'm going to try a few of the things that I just read about, about training the cats. And um, didn't tell him that, but um, <laughs> that's, what, that's what I'm going to do. So, but this is how he came, presented himself. He'd had a spinal cord injury, and really you're going to say, well, it was a mild one, right? But you can start to distinguish what some of his issues were. Um, now, this was his self-selected pace. It's probably someone in his 40s. Happens to be an orthopedic surgeon. Um, and I think you can start to see uh, the deficit on his right side. This is him trying to run. So the faster he went, the harder it got to, um, to move and he really got frustrated by it. Um, and I was like, well, okay, here's what we're going to try. And so I uh, got my little treadmill out and I said, well, here you go. Um, we're just going to walk on the treadmill. You can see how he starts and his hands are off the treadmill. And I'm in a very good position to catch him if he goes flying off the back. <laughs> and um, and so, uh, so I put him on there and then he, he's talking and then I speed up the treadmill and then he grabs the thing and he holds on. I'm like, oh, fine. But what does he look like here? A little better, right? There's some symmetry. It's not perfect, but what I decided was, well, I'm going to train you on this thing. So I trained him for four weeks 
Um, I didn't really train him. I had a graduate student now stand at the back of the treadmill and be ready to catch him. But he became better, and you can see that as he trained on the treadmill. He, um, uh, he'll be there in just a minute again. And you can see him upright. Occasionally, he'd lose his balance. He'd kind of catch himself. But the speed got better. He got better on the treadmill, more comfortable. I had no overground component. It was just using that one component I'd heard because really didn't need any other support. He could stand up, et cetera. Um, and this is what he looked like after uh, four weeks of training. And I said, well, that's pretty good. Um, that, that, and oh, he can even walk faster. And I thought, well, that's good. Um, and then this is a month later after we stopped training. So I just wanted to be sure he was still able to go. Um, he's holding, a, now we're collecting a little EMG. He's holding that, but he can show you that, yep, he can even walk faster with that. Now, um, he's a very type A type person. And uh, after this, what he really wanted to know was, um, okay, well, how are you gonna help me? I wanna um, uh, skate, you know, skateboard, or I want a rollerblade, or I'm going to be coming down the mountain with my snowboard, and I'm like, man, um, okay. But he moved to Colorado, and someone else had to work with him there. <laughs> so, where's Megan? Did you guys get him? Um, anyway, so Reggie published a paper and spoke at the American Spinal Injury Association in uh, 1991, and he had written this paper entitled "A Physiological Basis." for the development of rehabilitative strategies for spinally injured patients. Wonderful paper, might get it out even today. And he had like nine or 10 principles that he had developed and said, hey, I learned something more about the spinal cord. And based on this, you might consider using these to develop a rehabilitation strategy for people with spinal cord injury. And then, and then he left it like that. Now, He's not a physical therapist. He doesn't work with humans. He works with cats and animal models. And, and, um, and that's, then he stopped. He said, OK. And what was interesting, though, was he ultimately um, hired a postdoc. Now, Cheryl Flynn on the left was my graduate student. And you met Ed Worth. He was the MD, PhD in the Syringomyelia project um, that I'd worked with. Both of them happened to go to uh, scientific conferences maybe a month or two apart, came back and said, Andrea, Andrea, you've got to go meet this person, Susan Harkema. You won't believe what she's talking about. You would love this stuff. And so they started to talk about her load paper, which was published, I think, in 1997. And the load paper is the basic one that drives what we do today about changing the load. If you increase the load, whether it's a person with a complete, incomplete, or, or um, healthy individual without an injury, changes the EMG response or activity from that. And so they're going, you got to go meet her. And I, the first time Cheryl came back as a graduate student, I was like, oh, yeah, I don't need, what are you talking about? Then Ed comes back and I said, this is really crazy. I got two people who've met somebody who thinks I should go meet this person. So I pulled up her paper, read it, and then I called her out of the blue one day and said who I was, what I was about, and then I started talking to her about the patient you had just seen or the subject you had just seen a minute ago. And I said, you know, I put this person on a treadmill and I sped up the treadmill. Well, she had never heard anybody say they, they would, first, I don't think she'd ever met a physical therapist. And then, um, <laughs> okay, I know why you're laughing. <laughs> but anyway, so um, I, I talked to her about this and she was getting very excited on the other end because she, she couldn't believe someone had done this. And she was doing work like that to figure out that speed makes a difference. And I said, oh my gosh, she's so much better and all this stuff. So um, by the end of it, she goes, well, why don't you come out here and spend the summer? And I said, well, that sounds like a good idea. Uh, you know, so, um, so I work it out with my university to go out to LA. That sounds like a good thing for the summer. Um, I stayed in, uh, well, what's the name of the town? But anyway, it's right near the university there. Uh, rented like a little apartment. Oh, it was wonderful. Every day I'd have breakfast outside. It was gorgeous. I'd walk two blocks, come to work, come back. Um, and uh, so I, I, I took that uh, road to LA. Um, there was Susan, myself. Interestingly enough, Michelle Basso joined us that summer. So she had called Susie on a separate um, uh, scenario and she ended up there. So um, we were having all these great conversations and another person, if some of you may know, is Kathy Sullivan. She's done work in stroke. Um, so there we were, the four of us over the summer working together and uh, 
generating a lot of ideas, talking about grants and such and what we can do. But one of the things that came out of that summer was this, these four principles. And so Susie was working in a treadmill, doing all these things, but she had, she had no way of expressing it. And so we, we sat her down and she's doing all these things and, and I'm going, now why and what are you doing? <laughs> and because really she hadn't started expressing it to anybody else or trying to explain it. Now I forgot one thing to tell you. She became Reggie Edgerton's postdoc, but when she came, um, he had done, as I said, all this animal model work. And he said, hey, here's an interesting problem. See if this works in humans. I'll talk to you later. And so a year or so later, he comes back and he's going, well, how's that going? Um, and really, it, it was much like that. She had to learn everything about EMG and spinal cord injury and muscles and all this. I mean, it stretched her to the hill. But, you, you know, Susie, she's driven. And so she went and took the animal literature and said every one of the things that he had done in the animals, he wanted to know, she wanted to know, does it work in the humans? And so she worked with first people with complete injuries and then incomplete and, and those who have not had an injury to understand if the spinal cord really functions across all these domains and, and aptly works. So out of that summer came the four locomotor training principles. They have stayed the same except for one which we'll talk about if you haven't heard. Um, and so we, with, um, since that time. And so we wanted to give people a, a way of thinking and decision making without telling you specifically every decision, possible decision you would have to make. And I think they've, they've stayed tried and true. They're all based on science. Um, you can go back to the literature and find them in the animal or the human literature as to why um, uh, they're appropriate and work. And so that summer after I came back from California, Susie was working with people with complete injuries on the West Coast and I was working with people with incomplete injuries on the East Coast. And so I was like, okay, let's, let's try and work out these principles. Now, you all have a ton of, of uh, ways to um, make progression and decisions and all that. We didn't really have all that worked out by, back then. We were, we were um, starting to put that together. So I'm just going to give you a few quick examples um, from that period. Uh, this gentleman here, as you can um, tell, had a very asymmetrical injury. And again, you would say a very mild mild injury. But this again was the outcome of, of typical um, rehabilitation. Now look at this exotic body weight support system that we had back then. All right, so and look at our seats. I've got a bench. I've got one of those nice football chairs you go to the game and um, take with you <laughs> and sit on. Um, and so it was a very streamlined system. Uh, we had introduced these um, uh, kind of horizontal poles on the treadmill early back then to get some uh, symmetry with him and I think you can already see uh, now we're doing nothing just watching him <laughs> and then all the way to what he looked like um, afterwards so gaining um, more flexibility with the right um, knee being able to step through more adaptability etc cetera, etc cetera. all right and this one uh, has been published online and, and one you've seen in the modules but I'm just going to walk through it briefly the top is how he looked um, after his spinal cord injury Again, you're going to say mild because he's on his feet and walking, but this is a high school principal. He lives out in rural Florida, has a, a farm with cows, lives in a two-story cabin. Um, he uses a scooter in the school system. He says, I can't get turn off the, uh, or uh, shut out the fires uh, that happen in the school a lot um, with kids. I have to use a scooter to get around very quickly. The bottom picture is the, the outcome for that individual. So how did it look early on? Again, um, here he was with uh, an assistive device, uh, a brace, and um, hip hiking his way uh, through. Early on, we um, put him on the treadmill, and um, you're going to see kind of an evolution of the locomotor training. He'd already graduated. We didn't need anybody on the other side. You can see I'd like to get his trunk upright a little bit more. Ah, there it goes. And so there were times when we were on his leg, we would start to come off his leg. What was that called? Step adapt. So step adapt became um, a part of what we did because we started to talk about independence. Again, Susie on the West Coast had never taken people off a treadmill. She didn't even think about overground because they were people with these complete injuries. And so we started even there thinking about taking those people off the treadmill. Um, 
So there is an overground component. We started to introduce devices, but how would you use an assistive device differently? All right, so even though it's the same device, this one we made a little bit higher. It became very cognitive for him to take steps, but I wanted his trunk up right. Um, he had been taught by this walker. When, very early on when he used the walker, took the walker away, he stood like this. And he, if you stood him like this, he would be, oh, I'm going to fall, I'm going to fall. So he had, he had no concept of what upright was because he'd been programmed and taught with that um, walker for so long. So we're back on the treadmill. Um, watch the bottom of the treadmill. This is our very highfalutin adaptive uh, uh, device system here where we're having things roll at him and he's going to step over them. Now I'm pretty sure he couldn't do that early on, all right? So he was able to step over um, devices and things like that. We used kind of this roving parallel bar system and then he was able to um, uh, mobilize and take steps from there. One of his personal goals was to be able to walk for 30 minutes on the treadmill, so he initiated that. And then ultimately he was able to um, walk uh, without a brace. Um, yes, he has a little bit of a foot drop, but he doesn't want to wear that brace and, and uh, he wears it out into the cow pastures. He doesn't, he, he's able to go, uses a cane out in the pastures. All right, so if we look at the principles again, um, we added this one recently. It's not really a principle, it, it's a foundational point for everything. That you have to be able to challenge the system. Uh, Michelle Bassa was visiting us here recently. We had a little dinner together. Um, Hugh Barbeau, who also had worked on this um, from uh, Canada, he always would say, oh, you, Susie, you need to challenge the system, challenge the system. And, and she never wanted us to add that word. I understand why, but we did uh, with her and Michelle and I together at a, at a restaurant recently. So I think you can understand. You can't just do the same thing over and over, and you know that well, that we need to challenge the system. So let's look at that concept once more in this individual. He's 23. He was injured. He's a motocross racer. Um, he wasn't injured in that activity. He was in a, a car accident, slammed into a, a tree. This is his outcome, and I'm thinking again, that's pretty good, pretty mild. But when you're 23, not so good, right? So um, here he is the first day on the treadmill. And I just said, I said to him, well, have you walked on a treadmill? And he says, oh, yes, I can do that. And I said, well, all right, um, let me just have you do that. That's his mother, had her run the speed. And, I, and so um, I said, so let her know, you know, any faster. And uh, my graduate student was saying faster. And oh, my gosh, there he goes. <laughs> um, I'm like, OK, well. And I, and I said, well, I thought you told me you could walk on a treadmill. And he goes, yeah, 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 I can, but I use one that has bars on the side. I said, oh, okay. So here he is compensating already. All right, and I can walk on a treadmill. But look what happens. Yes, he's better when he has something that is giving him some support on the arms. So I'm like, okay, let's try this. So now the person at the front isn't touching his chest, and I just said, Hold it back up here. I don't want you to let yourself go forward. We moved his pelvis underneath. I'm helping his right leg. And already he's starting to look good. And I'm going, OK, this is going to work out. All right, and so then we put him through training. This is how he looks um, later down the road. Well, that looks pretty good. And then so this is his outcome. I'm a little miffed at his rounded shoulders. We should have gotten those. But anyway, he still looks pretty good. He can walk faster. This gentleman turned into uh, a trainer at one of these recovery-based centers out in San Diego. He still he does bike riding, he does um, running, he does all these kind of triathlons, things like that. Um, so for many years, we've published uh, many articles uh, based on um, uh, this work that came about through that um, through that period of time, predominantly um, with uh, the adult population and. Um, then something happened, another <laughs> fork in the road. And uh, a mother sent me a videotape. OK, that's a problem. <laughs> and um, it was uh, Christmas. And I'd, it was a finished of what they call a K award for research from NIH. And in the study, I had um, written it for people really 18 and above. But I'd written down that I could take someone down to six years of age. And so this is the video she sent me. and. Um, her son, it was three and a half when he was injured, and I was like, oh. So she showed me this. I mean, I'm looking at this, 
and I'll show it to you in a minute. And I, and I told the people in the lab, I said, look, it's Christmas. Why don't we just try this? I really had no business doing it. Um, and, I, and I said, look, we don't know what's going to happen, but let's just, uh, let's just try and see. And, but I want you to look at this child and what he teaches us in this video. All right? So he's had, his, had an injury. They're doing hippotherapy. He's on the horse. And they're trying to get him to learn to balance, all right? And they're ask, they keep asking him to raise his hands up. And so you'll hear hands, hands, and that means they want him off the saddle, okay? So watch his face in particular. Hands. One hand. There you go. And what did he tell his mother? Well, no. Mom, no. Not good. All right? So he knows that this is not a good idea. All right? So he knows his neuromuscular capacity. And if I lift that hand, I'm going to fall. And so the first time they said hands, he said, sure. <laughs> <laughs> and then they said, hands, hands, hands. And he's like, you are crazy people. <laughs> Why are you making me do this? And then I love it. He turns to his mother, you know, because she said it the loudest. And um, I had to save him. No, I was like, so um, they had been looking everywhere. And, and so I sat with my, the, the lab staff and I said, let's just do it. Um, talk to the mother, explain um, we'd never done this with a child before. Um, let's see what happens, uh, but there's no guarantees. So this became the kid's step study. We were looking for children that had little to no isolated voluntary movement and what is their pattern of recovery and what substrates might contribute to this. Um, briefly, had a spine, uh, gunshot wound. Uh, the most important thing to tell you, especially if you're a parent, is that he was visiting another home. Uh, uh, neighbors, they didn't know them well. He went into the bathroom. There was a loaded pistol in the bathroom behind the toilet. It was very tiny, just picked it up, thought it was a toy gun. Um, came into the bedroom, just was trying to get on the bed with it, and then a gunshot went off, and he shot himself and, and went into his cervical area. Um, so um, you can see there the, um, the lesion itself. Um, here. Um, so uh, for 16 months he was not ambulatory, had all the conventional um, therapy. You can see how he uh, commando crawls at that time. Um, he came to us for a study. He was already using a wheelchair and um, this was his first day in the lab. Yep, he's adorable. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay so this is his first day in the treadmill environment if you can watch his upper back the tech's going to ask him to get his shoulders back in a minute a, a, a word we say often to the children but already he could get his shoulders back um, very passive with his arms in this position and very passive on this first day we take him over ground he says it seems like it's going too fast really for a five-year-old this is not too fast but in this environment it is and so we we slow it down but I think what you can see is we're actually lifting his legs putting them up and down so I explained to the peds group this morning um, what uh, happened here is that um, um, I'm very frustrated I want to get a, um, a movement out of his uh, out of his leg um, into flexion and I hadn't been able to do it before I called Susie and said hey help me out I gotta get flexion out of this leg and her response was believe in the spinal cord, and um, follow the principles. She's like a guru. <laughs> and I'm like, um, you know, and, and then she hung up. And I'm like, <laughs> okay, thank you, thank you. Um, so, uh, but she was right. That's what I had to go back to. And uh, we talked about this. Nobody always knows what to do, but you know the principles. Go back to them, use them um, to make a decision going forward. And so uh, we did. Um, put this children in, uh, child in a, in a uh, stride position, one where we could take advantage of load, shifted him. The only thing we added was a, a strum at his hip flexor, so that was an added cue on the right side. Lo and behold, he took this flexor step um, based on those cues, and then I was like, okay, the next two weeks, <laughs> I was a mirror in front of him, and he's talking to himself and all this. Um, look at that big honking hanger over him, though. Do you see that? I mean, that's an adult hanger for this four-year-old. Um, so we had to get rid of that. But anyway, he's, uh, 
um, now doing this and I said okay for the next two weeks it's hip flexor blitz everything we do is augmented I want these big I want the nervous system to know what flexion extension flexion extension all right so that's what we were doing um, something you can do with children that you can't do with adults is give some of those same cues over ground. So we're going to give a cue on the right and then we're going to assist the left and then watch the right again. So cue, assist, boom. All right, so that's his first step without a cue. What we want to see after that is maybe two steps. Maybe it wasn't consistent um, the next day, but that's what we're starting to look for or less cues or things like that are getting those types of responses. So here he is. Um, uh, that was session 23 this is session 31 all right so um, now we're just a little over a month into his stay he's gone down the hallway we put this little apparatus on him so we could go a little bit faster and get speed um, and not break our backs and uh, so everybody's been queuing 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 and I was like oh I'm tired of queuing let's just see what he can do and so occasionally we had to challenge the system so I turned no. Asked him, he says, no, can't get it going. <coughs> there you go. That's it. That's it. Nice. All right. There you go. Good. Go. That's it. Nice job. Yeah. It's the first time he acknowledged that he had taken those steps. The other times when we were queuing, he really wasn't aware, but this time he was aware of what happened. Next day, took 15 steps. Um, we also trained standing on the treadmill. What I love about this is we're, we're working on standing, and uh, he knows he holds on, and then he's to let go and stand there, and we count, et cetera, et cetera. Well, he was doing this, and that weekend he went to a, a birthday party, had birthday cake in front of him. He was standing at the table like this. His mother is holding him from behind, and he turns and he says, uh, to his mother, you can let go of me now. And he's standing right there, and then he turn, he stands there about a minute. So see, he's standing here a while, uh-oh, loses it. And um, he turns to his mother after a minute and says, you can hold on to me again. <laughs> and so she comes back on. But how wonderful that this child, only about four and a half, gets it. That he's changed the neuromuscular capacity, and that's what we want. My gosh, as trainers and therapists, we don't have to go home and tell them to do this and that. They've got a new capacity. They're going to explore the world, and they're going to use it to their advantage. And so there he was already um, taking advantage of that. And so now if you look at him on the treadmill, and, and you can, I think you can sense and feel the quality and the difference of his steps. Much, you can feel more voluntary response, even though we're helping him. That's session 65. And now, how fast am I going? I'm going faster than Dash from The Incredibles. That movie had just come out. We used it with him because Dash runs like this, and his shoulders are straight up and back. And so we would even have a poster, and he'd chase and, and, uh, and race Dash in the, in the clinic there or in the lab. Um, so there he is going faster than Dash, and this is how he ended up um, over ground. He's not wearing a brace, a little device that counts steps. Um, this was on our little uh, field trip. And the mother said we, at one point she had a gait belt around him as she was um, practicing or walking with him. And she goes, Andrea, when, when do we take the gait belt off? And I'm going, I don't know. I don't know when we take it off, you know. And here's the thing. The kid turned and one day goes, Mommy, I don't need that anymore. Isn't that amazing? And he, he was like, I, I just couldn't believe it. He knew, take it off, go away, I'm fine. And so she did, and off he went. So he started uh, elementary school, or kindergarten, excuse me, um, as a full-time ambulator. Uh, they brought his chair in for a field trip one day to an apple orchard, and everybody, all the other kids were like, what's that? <laughs> Why is he in that? I mean, they couldn't understand that um, at all. One of the great things that came out of this study, besides 50% of the population walking, 100% of the children in, in improved trunk control. And I think if you can look at the side on the left and the side on the right, you can look at a major difference in the child and really that kind of pot pear belly um, versus that tubular look, the change in the musculature, the difference in the head position, his ability to reach. So many things changed in that child um, across time. This was another child. So one of the key things that changed was we had a, um, a change in the, in the functional ability but really not a change in the motor score. 
The child had a synergistic pattern before, so we talked about synergies. And if you look here, this is after training, but this is how he extends his leg in a synergy. It's not like you or I would kick a ball. It's more hip, knee, and ankle extend at the same time. Now he can uh, position himself and do his legs up and back like this um, now very actively. We did several tests to try and look at descending circuitry. One of them was to look at the corticospinal tract to see if that was um, uh, intact. Um, it turns out in none of the children that we tested, it's not a, a very sensitive test, but anyway, we did it. Um, no one had cortical spinal tract integrity below the lesion except for one child who had a hamstring um, uh, function already, um, but that proved to be correct. We did something called the acoustic startle test that tests the reticulospinal tract. It's a very um, uh, ancient uh, tract, if you will. It, it's um, relative to excitement of the system. It activates um, stepping. And so what the child is wearing a headset and a, and a big train horn will go off in a minute. Uh, just like if someone uh, dropped a set of china right next to you, you would startle. What we're looking at is the EMG activity below the lesion. And so here's what you're looking at as a sound stimulus. And in this case, um, we only see activity below, above the lesion. And the gentleman, and excuse me, in the child above, when we look at that, we see activity in all the muscles. So watch just this for a minute, and this will happen here. So he's listening to the headset, watch his legs. So there's a startle, and the startle went everywhere. Um, and so he's going, what was that? Um, so it's supposed to be a surprise. Um, <laughs> okay, so these are the many graduate students that have... Um, helped through the years at the University of Florida and were um, instrumental in the, the work that was done there and, and many have uh, gone on to great careers since then in physical therapy programs um, and otherwise. One of the greatest things in my life, which you all are aware, well aware of, so I'm going to go through some of this more rapidly, but is the Neuro Recovery Network. And um, it, it is hard to express how special this network is um, not only to us, but to being able to disseminate knowledge and information to our profession and others. And I really think if there were more ways to have more networks that did stroke or head injury or other aspects, we could move the profession forward a lot faster when we standardize care, collect data, and then try and um, inform and disseminate practice. Um, you're familiar with all the sites here. You're very familiar with activity-based locomotor training. You're also very familiar with the neuromuscular recovery scale that, that this group, um, who helped with that? Raise your hand if you helped with that. Go ahead, there's a few. Oh, there's more, come on. All right, so it was amazing. How many people were, probably about 20 people around the table the first time we tried to do this and to try and put together what would a recovery-based system, it was clinicians and researchers, very proud of this, um, um, this work and so, uh, many papers and other things have been done to establish its validity and reliability in the adult, adult population. But what we considered um, was that we also perhaps in the long term needed one for pediatrics. So one day, um, gosh I feel it was like seven years ago maybe or six, uh, Susie called me, I was at the University of Florida driving down the highway and she said, well how about now? And what she meant was about five years earlier, she'd asked me if I wanted to come to the University of Louisville and I said no. <laughs> and uh, she was moving here from California and I was like, no, I'm fine. I'm fine in Florida, Louisville, Kentucky. And I, and I was like, no. And um, she just, she couldn't understand why I said no. But so she called me again and she goes, how about now? And, um, and I said, maybe. And, and she's like, oh. And, um, so she did something, and this was very wise on her part, and she said, uh, uh, why don't you write your own job description, and then I'll hire you to do that. <laughs> and, and I was like, well, that sounds, that sounds like a good idea. <laughs> but the problem with that is once you do it, you have to take the job. Um, and uh, so I wrote this incredible job, and I was like, well, this is what I want to do. I want to start a pediatric um, clinical program here and, and have a research arm as well. And um, she's like, fantastic, that sounds great. And um, really, I was, I was scared to death to do that. Um, uh, you know, I, I was at the University of Florida 21 years, I'm comfortable. Hey, 
for some of you who don't know, this is the view outside my back door. I lived on a lake. I had sunsets every night and a dock. I'm, I'm comfortable. I just refurbished my kitchen. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, had no, I had no reason to leave. Uh, my brother lives three hours away. Um, it's just it's delightful. But I got to tell you, for my career and personally, really and professionally maybe, um, I've been doing the same thing for a while. It's the same, you know, and I knew the, I knew the environment, I knew the issues at the University of Florida. There's no major um, rehab center there. I don't see people with spinal cord injury every day. I really wanted to put them in front of me. I wanted that problem to be in my sphere all the time so I'd be thinking about it. And um, what I was most frustrated is you'd publish something and you just put it on a shelf. It doesn't really do anything. It doesn't really go anywhere. And I really wanted to change clinical practice. I wanted to change what we do, make a difference in people's lives. And that's not possible in, in your ivory tower somewhere. So I was going, okay, well, I got to take the leap. And um, so came to the University of Louisville, um, an incredible environment here, and through a series of events, um, made probably Susie's dream come true because she'd been trying to develop this, this thing called here called Cozair Charities, a very incredible um, uh, group of people that work to um, fund things for children, everything from dental care to cancer care in this community in, in southern Indiana. And they gave $7.3 million to launch this um, incredible program. And, and research network. So we had three goals, deliver the state-of-the-art therapy, um, conduct the research to help change the practice, and then to um, train uh, new pediatric rehab physicians and such. So as I said before, we developed a clinic. That took us a while. It took us two years to actually get the clinic running. And we had to do everything, figure out all these aspects, hire people, train people, um, and just so many logistics, uh, find a physician, as Dr. Thompson, to, to help join us. and. Um, but it worked. And so I'm, gonna inter I'm just going to give you two quick cases and then we're going to wrap this up. Um, so this was our second child that came to us. She had had uh, 350 sessions of therapy over two and a half years. She was injured at three months of age. Imagine that, kind of a C5-6 um, injury. She'd already been hospitalized multiple times um, for pneumonia. You can look at the plethora of musculoskeletal issues had. Look at all the equipment she was given by age two and a half. She just had everything and a lot of pulmonary type equipment also. Um, she was transported and reclined in a kid cart or she had just started to drive this power wheelchair that you see there. But she was basically dependent. Her mother would put her on a bed and say, she's not going anywhere that I don't take her or put her. Now, I want you to look at her. This was her initial evaluation and particularly try and look at her breathing pattern her inability to sit, and her discomfort with this setting, all right? So we've put her, Shelly's put her in sitting, and you can tell she doesn't really do much here. She even figures out ways to bring her hand to her mouth and support herself because she's looking for some form of stability. This isn't the way I usually sit. Um, again, kind of her labored um, breathing. This was her first day on the treadmill. I mentioned this child had bilateral hip dislocations. That's not typically something we do, but listen, we figure this child had really nothing to lose and much to gain if possible. And so we said we're gonna take a risk. Many children with CP are on treadmills or walk without, with dislocated hips. So we, this is our face, first day, it's very slow, but look what happens over time to her. She's like, this is great. Um, and I can move and I can wiggle and we ask them to move their arms and her, her trunk starts to move. She gets a lot more mobility. Um, she's running with the puppies. They're in the wee in front of her and off she goes. And listen to her now. <laughs> okay, what's amazing is when she first came in, she was very, she didn't talk much, and if we clapped or sang or were loud, she'd go like this, <laughs> and um, 
you know, she really hadn't been tossed and moved a lot. Why would you toss a child that's going to go like this? I mean, so there wasn't a lot of movement in her world, and now she was doing all these kinds of things. Everything we were doing on the treadmill was to enhance extension, so all the activities were done above and above here, and we're getting to spell letters and do all things. Turns out this child is a jock. We give her opportunities to do one thing or another, and she'd always choose a ball or a bat or a toss or a swing or hit, something like that. She didn't want to dress any dolls. She didn't want to shop. Um, and so um, we had all these kinds of things. Now, this little child now is playing tennis, all right? So she can, then she couldn't hold the racket. Now she can. So all these kinds of activities on the treadmill encourage that. They're very age appropriate. Um, but we also do things off the treadmill, translate that. And so you can see her giving um, support here and uh, helping her uh, control her trunk. Interestingly enough, how well she translated that to off the treadmill into everyday use. Here she's in a manual chair, throwing the beach ball to Tigger. What more could be uh, great for a child? But here's interesting, we also took her into... Uh, so we wanted to look at things that we could do in the home environment. How could we take a child who can't move at all and give her an opportunity to move? So we even asked the mother, can you... Uh, take this child and just take her out of the chair and put her on the floor. And the mother's like, well, why would I do that? She can't do anything. And we're going, well, we're going to try and change her capacity. And, and we want her to want stuff, think about moving, go places, whatever. So the mother's okay. And, um, but one of the other things we did is we put a rocking chair in her home. And so we just wanted her to start moving and even if she's starting with her arms to do that that's fine because what we're hoping is the trunk or the legs will come into that pattern she loved the rocking chair loved the rocking chair um, again we moved her from a power chair to a manual chair um, the mother was at first very frustrated with us to, to do that she'd spent hours trying to get this power wheelchair for her daughter and now we were saying give her a manual chair and she's like oh my gosh these people um, out of the two uh, uh, the mother was much more skeptical of us and the father was much more yeah let's go um, but it was a good combination and um, what she started to do was see her daughter begin to change um, before, her, before her eyes. And so if we look at here, this was, again, after 20 sessions of locomotor training, and you look at her trunk, really isn't much better, right? But let's look here at 146 sessions. And already I think you can see the difference, and then let's just watch her a few minutes. So she's in short sitting, she's much more upright, she's more casual with her arms. Now we're gonna look at her in long sitting. And look at already what she can do. She can even lift her hands to grab things. And here she's doing something fantastic. She's going to um, stack some blocks. Now, things aren't perfect. Um, she's going to lose it. Ah! But, all right, they help her back up. Um, Shelly's not holding her behind, but she's able. Look how she, attentive she is to that block. She wants them all straight. And um, so give me that block. I got things to do. Starts building here. She gets a little distracted. Somebody's, oh, no, nope, there we go. Back with that block. Now, just think for a minute how high this thing is getting and her being upright. So the higher this gets, the harder it gets on your trunk. So take your arms for a minute. Just put them out. Everybody sit up. You got two minutes here. Sit up away from the chair. Start building. Susie, building. Thank you. Building your blocks. All right, go up one, another, another. So look how much effort that takes out of you. And look at that high block she just got, that big, huge tower she built. All right. Oh, no. All right. So things are changing. Listen to what her mother says. And this is one of the things people, I think, that don't have a child with a disability take for granted as far as being able to put your child in a grocery cart. This has been a main problem for me for a long time because she couldn't sit up. Now I can put her in a grocery cart. I have to put a blanket behind her so she doesn't get any little red marks, but I put her in there and I don't have to have a special seat or a special tool or a special anything. I can. And so amazingly you change the capacity of the child, you change their function, and you actually change the quality of life of the caregiver. All right, so the, child, the caregiver becomes more of a parent. So many things happen to change as you have seen in this child's life. Um, also that she became uh, a manual wheelchair user. 
One of the other great things is she didn't have pneumonia again. All right, and so that we really changed her respiratory capacity. Um, she's still in a manual wheelchair. Uh, she was supposed to see us recently, and the mother calls and says, oh, she's going on a Girl Scout trip. She can't come see you. And I'm like, fabulous, all right? So um, uh, very engaged in her world. People have asked us, is this maturation? Is this natural recovery? Um, uh, it, it, did compensation lead to this? Did all those 350 sessions make a difference prior to this? And I really don't think there's any report in the literature that says that severely paralyzed children grow out of paralysis and immobility. I don't think that's what happens. I've already shared this with you, so I'm going to go through, I'm just going to pass through these slides as I shared this the other day about who we're seeing in the clinic now. But I want to just mention the, the couple things that we've learned. And the key thing is that we are able to make a difference in uh, trunk control. This graph, and just to orient you to it very briefly, if you look on this side, looks at the amount of support that we give as we assess trunk control. So we might give support at the shoulder and assess above, so the head and above. We might give it here and assess above. Down here is no support. We're assessing all the way from the pelvis above. So again, full trunk control to only head control. These are um, 18 children that we've seen across time. If you can follow the green line in the middle, that's the average for all the children. Total score is a 20 is a perfect. And so if you look here and look at that score, we're actually making changes across. And what this is is children who scored at very low level, moderate level, and high level. And those are their, their scores across time. We've also looked at time since injury, chronic, and um, acutely. And the same pattern ac uh, exists across all. And the main thing is we see a significant change as you go to the first, the second, or first to the third, or first to the fourth um, uh, bout of exercise, or 20 sessions, and then two to four. So we're making significant changes in trunk control. And as we just gave you an example there, um, the mother demonstrated to you kind of what happens into the community and what happens to the child that makes a difference not only for her but for the child. So one of the other things that's um, probably frustrating is not everyone walks and so but what seems to happen is a lot of children are able to kick a ball. And so these are children that are either kicking it again in their lifetime, haven't kicked it since entry, or never kicked a ball in their lifetime. So they seem to have ability to kick, but not to stand up against gravity. And so that's a problem. Well, we're looking at the presentation of activity, and we have children that have low level activity, don't have reflexes, all the way up to children who have much more um, activity, as in this child here, if you look at his legs shaking, and now his arm's shaking and everything's shaking, but I think you can see that. So much more activity in these children. And then what you can see is those are the children that seem to be able to respond to cues more, as you saw in that first child, and start to show you a kind of a flexor or extensor response to um, a bit of the manual cues. So one of the things um, consistent is that we see the children that have a higher level of, of excitability seem to have a greater probability of a motor response. And so we have um, several ways to increase that excitability, whether it's afferent information, cutaneous input, or whether we use excitement. Um, and so I'm gonna give you one, ex one example here of this child and using excitement to make that happen. So we've talked about a child that had um, an injury at three and a half, he already walked an injury at three months of age, and this is a child who was <laughs> injured prenatally. So had a neuroblastoma at birth. He was already paralyzed when he was birth, at birth, had chemotherapy for that. Um, this is how he was uh, able to get around. So he uh, commando crawled, dragged his body with him. This is just a summary of his three years of therapy here. So in the first year, he had 60 sessions, we were able to get cued steps or a response um, of a step in response to our cues and his trunk control improved. The second year he initiated steps with a walker and some assistance and somehow he kicked the ball. Um, and the third year he could stand with a walker and initiate steps with a, with a walker. This is what his mother did at home uh, when he went home the first year. Same child that you saw a minute ago who was dragging himself could play with his brother and he just had a harness on he didn't have braces on, and he could stand and he could 
um, play occasionally, his mom would say, uh, legs straighten or something like that. Um, we ultimately used the term with him, turn on your legs, as a way to try and get them to activate him. But here he'd play, and what a great activity. She's, his brother is right there with him um, playing. This is another year, again, I can't quite understand how he did that, but he kicks the ball. Um, he was in a stride position, but no one initiated. I'm sure he did a fast uh, weight shift, but it was pretty good. Year two, he's back at home. Um, again, a very creative mother who has him doing things with his brother again, all kinds of hand signals or whatever. Even in this position, it was amazing because he'd be there and he would all of a sudden shift his weight and his other leg would take a step. And then he'd shift his weight and the leg would step back. And I'm going, this is amazing. All right, so um, a great activity for him um, to participate in, get weight bearing. So uh, I'm going to be done in about three minutes. Hang in there. Watch his legs. I want you to see he came off the treadmill. And here's this high activity. They're cycling right there. They're like ready to go. On, off, on, off. OK, so um, as I showed you, we might be working with them over ground, trying to turn on these legs. And in this instance, um, we'd walk them up to the end. There's some sort of re reward. He'd paint for about three seconds. And then we'd go, oh, time to go back. And, uh, and then we'd go, time to go again. You have to walk up here. And then you get to paint again. And he'd go up here. He'd paint three strokes. And we'd come back and do it again each time. So uh, his mother was coming to pick him up. And um, we said, oh, Let's surprise your mother. We took down the painting, we rolled it up, stuffed it in the walker, and she's coming in. Now, this child's like three, and we're, we're putting this all together. He's not saying a word, but we're telling him, your mom's coming in, you got this, you're going to surprise her, you're going to show the painting, you're going to walk towards her. He's got the game plan, we're all ready. And so this is what happens. She comes in the door, and um, again, he's in a walker, he has a harness, a little bit of thing to support him. But what I want you to see is Shelly's hands are going to come off the walker in a minute. Now he knows the game plan. Pull it. Pull the walker. Pull the walker. That's it. Pull it. <coughs> keep going. You've got to show her what you made for her. Keep going. Keep going. Pull the walker. Pull it. Pull it. Pull it. Big pull. Go. 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 Pull the walker, Andrew. Pull it up. 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 Big step. Pull it. That's worth another seven million, I think. <laughs> But anyway, all right, so um, amazing thing because he initiated that and you heard him grunting and groaning a bit to get it going. So there's all kinds of things. Um, we won't stop at anything to make a child excited or wanting to go get something. So again, they've set up the environment and Shelly's kind of going shh and everybody's quiet. She's going, keep it going, keep it going. Um, so what we were trying to do here was try and get this child independent in some way to be going home. He ultimately could stand with the walker, he could stand at home, just have it there and eat pizza while he was having dinner. So no braces on, could do that kind of activity. Um, so again, the, you know, you're looking at this and really I believe he's <laughs> attacking some uh, dragons there, all right? so. Down he goes. Excitement, all right? He's got to be excited about that. Um, again, another day, um, same type of thing. We're trying to get him to go somewhere. We're trying to use this apparent information where he's shifting his weight, all right? And so he's got this thing in front to get him to shift his weight forward. All right. 
Okay, so don't you remember when a box could be incredible? <laughs> all right, you take a refrigerator box and it became a fort and all these things. So um, we'll take all your refrigerator boxes. So one of the things is the excitement was a way to drive and excite the nervous system as well. We're hoping to look at stimulation in the long run. One of the key things I mentioned before to you was looking at children across time, and that's um, one of the important aspects that we're um, contributing um, here going forward. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip through some of these here. I talked to you earlier about developing the neuromuscular scale. Um, I also talked to you about developing the Kermit and the pediatric equipment. We mentioned that. We mentioned the harness system and being able to develop a modular system for pediatrics and adults. We have a whole lot of research going on here that looks at everything from mechanisms to the immediate effects of the intervention to the longitudinal outcomes, particular scoliosis, hip dysplasia. We're trying to develop the interventions. We may extend this to the CP population. As I mentioned, we're trying to develop um, equipment that's specific to children. Now we see neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity is the ability of the nervous system to respond to intrinsic and extrinsic stimuli by reorganizing its structure, function, and connections. But we've been talking about activity-dependent plasticity, and particularly in response to activity. But also it's a response to inactivity. And I think that's one of the key things, that when we started this conversation and you saw pictures of me um, with the cast on, that was inactivity and had a detriment to the nervous system. If you look back in the literature, the spinal cord has been neglected, so to speak, as part of the nervous system that really matters. And, and if you go back and look at articles here by Roy and Wolpaul where they're critiquing or they're talking about the spinal cord, its role has been substantially underestimated relative to postural control um, as well as locomotion. So again, you go back to my, ex my acute experience back in 1976 where I was immobilized, didn't have a spinal cord injury, but had nine months of non-weight bearing and how much it changed my muscle function, but also my neuro own neural drive to be able to use that muscle even for walking. That experience has gone with me for years and I, when I really look at what conventional therapy does with children with spinal cord injury, it mo immobilizes them. All the equipment is there to immobilize, support, and give them support against gravity. But it, it, I want to say it doesn't teach the nervous system, but it actually does teach the nervous system something. It teaches it not to move. Um, and so it's negating a lot of the experience and the afferent drive it needs to perhaps recover. So using a brace, putting them in a stander, giving them a peripodium, sitting them in a power wheelchair. And if that wasn't enough, we're going to take a paralyzed child and we're also going to manage their spasticity. And so we're going to use Botox because that will absolutely for sure shut off the system. If the spinal cord injury didn't do it, let's add some Botox. Maybe give them baclofen and a pump. And there again, this concept of managing spasticity has been with um, physical medicine and rehab and physical therapy for years as the problem. I'm not sure. I don't think it's the problem. I think it's, it's um, available. It needs to help us. Night and day braces do the same type of thing. I think I've given you examples of children that were able to um, really change their lives by activity dependent plasticity and therapy as such as that. Not only changes their lives, but changes the caregivers. There's many people that have been part of this work over the past several years and have, and have um, allowed us to expand and grow and grow and grow. So we now have nearly 30 people that are part of the pediatric neuro recovery team. I want to um, extend my thanks again to Shelly Trimble, who came here um, from the University of Florida and really in so many ways um, helped us move this program forward um, immensely. And then to, uh, excuse me, two other people, uh, Jack and Louise. Man, that's harder. Thank you. <laughs> I knew that would help. Thanks, Susie. <laughs> okay, so my parents, um, really, I've asked my brother um, why we're like this. I mean, we're kind of bulldogs. When, it, when you tell us something we can't do, we try and figure it out, and, and we really don't accept it. Um, you have a whole series of dominoes, a thousand dominoes, and one falls out, and we just figure out, well, how do we get it back in line so we can keep playing the game? And um, really, I think my parents gave us a lot of experiences in education and the confidence to do those kinds of things. Um, um, within our family and upbringing. Uh, my brother is an entrepreneur and a former Navy SEAL, to tell you a little bit about him. And I was preparing this uh, talk and I said, well, 
um, Doug, what makes us this way? Or how, how do we do this? How do we persist? And he goes, oh, I follow the three Ds. And he says, uh, <laughs> Doug, first. <laughs> and, then, uh, and then he goes, determination, dedication, and discipline. And Andrea, of all three, discipline is the most important. Wow. And, and, uh, but it's how he approaches his work and how he looks at it and how he continues. And let me tell you, this man works hard, but he plays super hard. Um, <laughs> every time I call him, he's on a golf course or fishing, and I don't understand how he does it, but, but that's him. Another colleague is Irene McClay. She's a, a, a physical therapist who, um, when, I, when I got the call from Susie, I also called Irene because she had left academics, the physical therapy department and ventured out and I wanted to see how someone else had do, done that. We've talked a lot about how we've pursued our careers and she says, well, in her lab we have the five Ps. And she goes, <laughs> you have to have a noble purpose. I get that. I think we have a noble purpose here. And she says, you have to have passion. Absolutely. How, and you have to have persistence. But then you have to have patience. And lastly, you have to have pride in what you do. And I think that's a good thing for not only our lab, but really it's instrumental to how we function here in the NRN. If you look at the gentleman on the left, he's the gentleman that uh, the second patient I had at Woodrow Wilson. And he's guided my thoughts and thinking ever since. But look lastly at this little girl on the right. And you've met her earlier and listen to what she's going to teach us. Can you tell your leg to stop? And you can. And you can. Is that not the coolest thing? And this little girl neglected her legs when she came here. And now she's having fun with them. Hey, look at what it does. <laughs> look what it does. And then, don't you love her mother? Can you stop it with her brain? She's starting a little experiment right there. <laughs> and, then, and then, yes, you can. Wow. So she's already given me hope, residual brain influence, all takes me all the way back to Dimitri Hevick. Um, so, yet knowing how way leads on to way, I doubted if I should ever come back. I never thought I'd ever come back to pediatrics, and here I am, University of Louisville, here part of the Neuro Recovery Network, and um, a road I thought I'd left behind a long time ago came back to me, and I'm so glad I did. I think you understand the title better now. You can let go of me now. Harnessing Neuroplasticity, T for good and the road not taken. Thanks.